And hold up your Bibles. Once again, we, we really take this book for granted, don't we? Yeah. You know, and we just be reminded that it's God's Word, God's infallible, inspired Word, and how He's preserved it over the centuries has just been remarkable. It really is. And it's, it's essential for our uh, for salvation. It's essential for our own Christian growth. Um, so let's say it together, fellow Christians. This is my Bible. Holy and true like its author. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I can do in his strength what it says I can do. Today I'll be taught the word of God. I boldly confess. My mind is alert. My heart is receptive. And by grace I'll be changed. For Jesus' sake. Amen. Father, we do, we do take your word for granted and you, you command us to let the word of Christ dwell in us richly and, and so often we don't do that. So we just want to confess our lack there and, and, and pray that would, we would be lovers of the Bible, lovers of your word, that we would hunger and thirst for you and to do that we need to hunger and thirst for your word. Renew uh, these desires within us. And Father, we pray that you would be with us now, in and through your word, instructing us, revealing things to us, challenging us, transforming us, maybe even saving us, we pray. Lord, lift up the Lord Jesus in our hearts, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So we are continuing in Genesis and we return to the third chapter of Genesis, as Rhonda said, in the, in the 16th verse. And uh, we are looking at the series of, on origins, of course. And, and the reason these, as I said before, these first few chapters in Genesis are so important is that they establish a proper and accurate worldview, which is going to be very contrary to the worldview that the majority of people have in, in, in the world. And, and you cannot understand why the world is the way it is unless you understand these early chapters of God's Word. Okay. Now last week when we looked at the first part of Genesis 3.16 where God curses the woman, we took note that the plight of, the, of, of women in the world has been very hard throughout human history. And for most of the world's women, it is still very hard. There is, of course, a general hardness of life produced by sin that everybody experiences, men, women, boys, girls, everybody. We all suffer the effects of the fall, don't we? You would have maybe getting up out of bed experienced the effects of the fall, you know. Uh, danger, disaster, disease, death. We all experience measures of sadness and sorrow and disappointment and unfulfillment and loss and heartbreak and etc 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 we all we know all those things and but beyond those general consequences which everybody experiences to one degree or another god carried out some special judgments in addition to the general difficulties of life caused by sin and that's what we've been looking at god placed a unique punishment on the woman and on all women and on the man and all men the judgment on the women on the woman because of her sin in the garden is in verse 16. Let's read it again. And, the woman, and to the woman he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you. And what we drew out last time was women were cursed to suffer in two relationships that most define their life. That is relationships to their children and relationships to their husband. To the husbands. Those really are the two realms in which women generally find their life. And through all the ages, women have suffered uniquely in those relationships. While there is a measure of joy there, it is those relationships that bring upon women their most consistent and most intimate trouble and sorrow. All the dangers, all the pains of pregnancy, all the dangers and pains of childbirth, and all the dangers and pain of child rearing. And as we know, that pain 
and uh, sorrow that comes with child rearing doesn't end when children leave home, does it, parents? Throughout most of history, women lived with suffering and sorrow in great measure connected to their childbearing, and still today there's a measure of that pain. Perhaps most of the suffering and sorrow today in the modern world with the benefit of modern medicine comes after childbirth in parenting them. Just the, just the sinful reality of your children and the sinful reality of your husband is enough to bring a measure of trouble into mothers' and wives' lives. Despite the huge influence the feminist movement has had on the Western world over the years, it's interesting, isn't it, uh, that women continue to be naturally drawn to husbands and to children as the source of their fulfilment and their joy even though they know that those are the realms in which there is the potential of the greatest pain and sorrow. Isn't that interesting? They're still innately, draw, they, they're, they're still innately drawn there because that's the way God made them. They find their greatest hope in marriage and in childbearing. They might want to get rid of the marriage thing and just, but they always they want to be with someone and have children to some degree. We saw last time the first area of God's curse on women is related to her children. After the fall, conception becomes more frequent, births become, births become painful, children become a source of pain, suffering and sorrow and disappointment. We closed last time by asking what can a mother do to alleviate this curse and we had some good discussions at our Bible study on Tuesday night about this. What can a mother do to reverse this, this, this to some degree? What can a mother do to turn this sorrow into some sort of more joy? And the answer, as you remember, is in 1 Timothy 2.15. Yet she will be saved, that's, the, that's, that's women, through childbearing if they continue in faith and love and holiness with self-control. And I'm the first one to say that that's a difficult verse to understand. But not only, but, but not only does, but what I think Paul's saying is, and I think it, it, it does impact on what Genesis 3.16 has, is not only does having children bring the curse, but it can also bring a form of deliverance as well. In other words, the very mitigation of that curse comes in the childbearing itself. If the woman, this is a big if, you ready? If the woman is a godly woman. And there's other factors there about, well, what is your husband? You know, are you married to a godly husband or an unbelieving husband or whatever? To say, that is to say, her life is marked by faith in the Lord, by sincere love for the Lord, by sanctification or holiness, by purity of life and self-restraint or self-control. This then, listen to this, this is key. This is what I didn't actually say in the sermon last week. This then provides the environment, you got it? This then provides the environment, godly mother, for God to do his saving work in her children that they also may continue in the same faith, love, holiness and self-control as their godly mum. And if that happens, can I say this, having godly children alleviates a lot of the sorrow. Having ungodly, wicked children brings great sorrow, like I did to my parents. Now this is, a one, this is, this is so wonderful, and, and it's, it's only for those who know the Lord Jesus, of course, who are redeemed, who are justified and sanctified and given the Holy Spirit who can enjoy this reality. That's a, that's a recap of last week. Um, and you know, you know, in God's grace, in all our parenting failures, uh, God can still do amazing things through our kids, hey? If, 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 if my parenting, though it does play a big part in my kids' life influentially, but if my, par if, if my parenting determines whether my kids go to heaven or hell, that's scary. No kids will go to heaven, or no kids will go to heaven. It was based on parents' faithfulness. That's a recap from last week. We now come now to the second area, the second realm, marriage. 
Verse 16 ends with, look at the verse, your desire shall be for your husband and he shall what? Rule over you. Yes, Jürgen, put your hand down. You've got women all around you. Okay. <laughs> Give it... Given that, a, given that a woman has suffering and sorrow in having, uh, in having and raising children, she's in great need, listen, of some tender comfort, some understanding, sympathy and compassion, and even defence. And sadly, the fact of the matter is, listen, though husbands were created by God to be this for their wives, sadly, since the fall, husbands have lacked all these things that the wife looks for. It's almost a proverbial saying, men don't understand women. That's true for their wives as well. Men through history have used and abused women, treated them unkindly, unfaithfully, indifferently, have demonstrated little compassion, little sympathy, expecting everything out of them, giving them little in return, making sure the women do everything they want them to do and need them to do, but giving back very little in the area of compassion, kindness, tenderness and sympathy. That was even true in the Jewish society. The Pharisees used to get up every morning and pray, I thank God I'm not a Gentile or a woman. In her sin, Eve took the lead. She acted independently from Adam and God and she spurned her husband's authority. You got it? She departed from her divinely designated role and led her husband into sin, usurping his role, acting independently of him in the temptation, overturning the divine order. That's what happened. He wasn't beside her. She, she should have submitted to him, sought his counsel, let him be the leader. By taking control, she lost it permanently. You got it? Just as by seeking the delight of the forbidden fruit, she lost true delight in the fall. She wanted to take the lead and she lost it for good. And the legacy of this conflict with her husband remains. And that's what is being expressed at the end of verse 16. Your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you. Remember, this is a curse. If Eve had known what she was going to have to deal with from Adam, she would never have taken the fruit in the first place. All of a sudden, man is changed and becomes a selfish, dominating monarch. The subordination of women was always God's plan, but in a loving, listen, in a loving, enjoyable harmony of perfect fulfilment of mutual wills, delighting in God and each other. Let me say it again. The subordination of women, women being subject to, their, to, to men, was always God's plan in a loving, enjoyable harmony of perfect fulfilment of mu mutual wills, delighting in God and each other. This has been taken away and the gracious subordination that was once there, the wonderful ruling partnership that was once there is gone. And the language here defines what happened. Let's take the first line. Your desire shall be for your husband. Some have suggested that this means a sexual desire. That's certainly not a punishment, is it? And that's, that is something God gave them before the fall. True? How else could he say, be fruitful and multiply, if they already weren't prepared to engage in sexual relationship? You got it? They had sexual desires for each other before the fall. So this means something else, doesn't it? This means that her desire is going to be something negative, something that reflects separation and alienation. Since the fall, everything reflects separation and alienation in relationships. That's why sometimes Mother's Day is not a time for, to, it is, if, you know, for, for, it's also a time to, to be thankful to God for our mothers, but it's also, it's, it's a hard time because it does remind us that often relationships can be fractured and alienated. There was enmity put between the serpent and the woman. Enmity was put between the man and the ground. And enmity is put between the wife and her husband. 
and she can't do what she wishes to do. She isn't going to live her own life totally independent like the feminists demand because her husband rules over her. Whatever she wishes, whatever she desires is subject to his will. She won't always get what she wants. She wants always to have what she desires. She's going to have to bear the sorrow of unfulfillment. She's going to have to, she's going to have, to have, she's going to have desires and dreams and ambitions that aren't going to be fulfilled because her husband does not have a perfect love for her, does not have a perfect understanding of her, and he's going to try and lead her in ways that lack compassion and sympathy. That is how it is in the world. It's reality. While sin has either affected man's leadership in he just lets woman rule and doesn't take leadership or he tries to dominate her. Both are sinful corruption. And there certainly is a case to be made by the feminists that can be supported in history that men have abused women historically and have and has abused the authoritative headship that the Bible teaches. They are stronger men. They have used their superior strength at the expense of women for their selfish gain. Now, now let's look at the specific language here that expresses the conflict. Your desire shall be for your husband. Now let's talk about the word desire. What does it mean? It's an interesting word. It comes from an Arabic root meaning to seek control. Literally, it could read, you shall seek control over your husband. You will desire to exert your will over him. That is a sign of the curse. You will desire to take charge, to be in control, to be master. And that desire shows up in women in various ways. And in some women, it's a quiet, silent desire that smoulders. With others, it's a shouting desire that isn't much a secret to anybody. And the more godless women are, very often the more hostile they are towards men. At least men who want to lead their wives. Not just, you know, you go, you be the boss, and I'll have the thumbprint on my, hand, on my head. Sometimes that hostility takes the attitude of coldness, indifference, apathy, because she can't achieve what she wants, she eventually becomes totally indifferent and apath apathetic towards the man. But there is this desire, this seeking to have one's own way, to yank the steering wheel of the marriage from the husband. That's why there, there have always been throughout history feminist movements. Even in the time of the Apostle Paul, there was a, a woman's liberation movement going on. Women were shaving their heads and going around bare-chested with spears in their hands and trying to prove that they can do everything men did. There have always been that kind of movement in history because it's reflective of this curse. On the other hand, verse 16, there's another aspect to this curse because between, men and, between uh, husband and wives and between women and men, and he shall rule over you. Let's look at the word rule for a minute. It means to dominate, to, to reign. Literally means to install in office. Has the idea of authority over. The idea is as, as the woman seeks to overthrow the husband's rank, as the woman seeks to twist the divine order, as the woman seeks to master her husband, seek control over him, he responds with domination. As the woman naturally leans towards rebellion, the man leans towards dictatorship. And you have there the battle of the sexes, right? That's why there's conflict in marriage or de facto relationships. And who, who would disagree that there is conflict in marriage? Who would, who would say, no, nah, there's no conflict in marriage? If there's no conflict, it's because one's just given up and there's conflict inside, resenting, but keeping the peace quiet. Now to help you see more clearly the meaning of your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you, look over in the fourth chapter of Genesis and verse 7. 
don't look over it, it'll be on the screen. But if you want to look at it, you can in your Bible. Here is the only other use of the Hebrew word for the desire in the Pentateuch in the first five books of Moses. And it is in the phrase, and it's, it's actually in a phrase that is, in, that is an exact duplication of the phrase at the end of verse 16 in Genesis 3. The phrase is in Genesis 4-7. This is the Lord speaking to Cain. Um, we'll get there soon. Genesis 4-7. If you do well, Cain, will you not be accepted? And this is after God confronting him after he killed his brother. And if you do not do well, sin, this is it, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. Fifteen verses away from Genesis 3.16 in Genesis 4.7, and you have an exact duplication of the phrase. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. Sin's desire is for you, Cain, but you must rule over it. You got it? The construction is absolutely identical. We learn in studying the Bible that when you have identical terms and identical construction in close proximity, then they mean the same thing and, or they express the same concept. What it is saying in chapter 4, verse 7, the Lord is speaking to Cain. He says, sin desires you. What does that mean? Sin wants to control you. Sin wants to dominate you. Sin wants to take over your life, but you must rule over it. You must master it. It's the same expression. The woman desires to control the man, and he rules over her. The woman then has the same desire for the man that sin has for Cain, a desire to control, a desire to have its own way. And the husband has the same need to control his wife that Cain had to control the sin. A woman's desire for her husband is a selfish desire sinful desire to get her own way and it, and it even shows up sadly in places where it shouldn't show up in the church. Paul is writing to Timothy in the church at Ephesus and he says 1 Timothy 2.12 I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. She is to remain quiet. Why does he write that? Because it was happening in the church. Because that's the natural tendency for fallen women even redeemed Christian women. Because it's part of the curse. What makes this a hundred times worse in the church is when the church itself teaches against male authoritative headship. And so many churches do. Don't they? And that just adds fuel to the fire for women's desire, innate sinful desire to exercise their authority over a man. Dangerous. And the church fuels it. As I said earlier, Eve resisted her husband's headship originally. She sinned and led Adam to, her, to do her will. God wanted him not to do it. She wanted him to do it. She took the lead. She convinced him to do it. She usurped his authority. She took the place of leadership. He submitted to her and he was therefore sentenced to have to deal with such a rebellion on a permanent basis from then on. The wife seeks control. The husband resists and tries to maintain his control. And that, of course, has a, as a sinful man, his leadership is not balanced it's not always loving, it's not always kind, it's selfish. And therein lies the conflict of marriage and, and that, is so, that is so universal. Man no longer has harmony in the home. She no longer follows, um, the woman no longer follows graciously. And like having children, marriage was designed to be the most joyful and fulfilling relationship on earth. And now it becomes a misery full of sorrow and disappointment. Can humans, can women liberation groups really undo this curse? No. Yes, we Christians should stand against the abuse, the degradation and the inequality of women. Absolutely. But we need to be realists, don't we? Only God can undo what he has done in this curse. Humans are not going to eliminate male oppression. They are not going to eliminate female rebellion. Therefore, divorce and marriage and marriage conflict will continue until Jesus returns. 
Conflict will always be there. It will always be there. And just part of, it's just part of the sentence, the payment of sin. And God, by cursing the woman, gives all, to all people a constant reminder of sin and its severity. The curses are an incessant reminder of sinfulness. And also hope that through Jesus there is a saviour who can deliver us from the curse. Now the question comes, as it did last sermon, is, is there hope of some relief from this? For fallen marriages, and, and well there is, and it centres on Jesus and his gospel transformation. Jesus can transform marriages. Turn to Ephesians 5. Um, you don't need to turn there, it's up on the board. And here again, beloved, uh, there, there is really no relief from this, uh, th from this apart from Jesus. No relief from this apart from the gospel. Now, you know, it's almost safe to say, rarely will you ever find a marriage among unbelievers that lasts a long time that is anything more than a truce. For whatever reason, they just agree to stay together. How many marriages have you seen that? You don't find marriages generally around the world among unbelieving people filled with joy and fulfilment and happiness and love and satisfaction to the point where they never consider anyone else because they are so totally fulfilled with each other where, where the friendship is the best friendship, where the love is the deepest. Rarely will you ever find that outside the realm of Christianity. Sad to say, even within the realm of Christianity, there are many who do not take advantage of what God has provided for us. But let's see what the pattern is, the ideal. See what, what is possible for those who are in Christ within marriages. In Ephesians 5, there is a principle that we need to look at at the start with, and it's in verse 18, Ephesians 5, 18. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with what? The Spirit. Now, there was this idea in ancient religions of the Greek world that drunkenness induced a state of, of hypersensitivity that catapulted you into communion with the gods. Now, Timothy Leary tried to popularise this, didn't he, in the 1960s in the drug culture. That somehow if you wanted a transcendental religious experience, uh, you needed to become drunk or high and that catapulted you into some sort of euphoria that connected you with the gods. And that was the way it was in Paul's day. You would, you would go to an orgy or a religious festival and you would drink yourself into oblivion under the false illusion that getting blotto and having sex gave you some kind of mystical experience with the deities. And, and the Apostle Paul says, if you want to have an experience with God, don't get filled with alcohol, get filled with the Spirit. If you want to commune with the living God, then be under the control of the Holy Spirit. And be filled with the Spirit is not a mystical experience. It simply means to be controlled by. Filled is simply the idea of being controlled, being dominated. If you say someone is filled with anger, you mean they're controlled by what? Anger. If they're filled with sadness, they're controlled by what? Sadness. If they're filled with the Spirit, they're controlled by the Spirit. What is the result of Christians living this way under the control of the Spirit and His Word? Well, Paul outlines it from verse 19 onwards. Let's read it. Um, Verse 19, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. That's overflowing praise and worship, isn't it? Giving thanks, and that's not just on Sundays. Giving thanks always and for everything to God, the Father, in the name of, of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. So whenever you find Christians who are totally lost in wonder and love and praise where you find people controlled by the Spirit, where they are filled with worship and filled with gratitude, where they are contemplating the greatness of their salvation, the wonder of grace, the beauty of the Lord Jesus and all that he has done for them, where you have those kind of people, then you have the possibility, listen, of reversing this curse. Then, because then we become to verse 22. Because all that Paul addressed in that verse, that's not natural, is it, to fallen man? Fallen man does not worship God. 
Fallen man does not submit to other people. They want to, you know what I'm saying? They, the pride, we don't, not gonna, no one's going to tell me what to do. So that's just, you're already seeing the reversal when you come under the control of the Holy Spirit. Look at verse 22. Because in verse 22, where Paul shows us that what, should, what, what could happen, what should happen when the Holy Spirit is taking control of Christians who are married. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body and it's himself its saviour. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. So Christian women, you don't, you, you don't want to rebel against your Lord, do you? You don't want to rise up against his authority and headship. You don't want to control him. So don't do it to your husband, Paul says. Why? For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. And wives filled with the Holy Spirit, filled with the Spirit's fruits, filled with worship, filled with thanks, filled with reverence for Christ, are going to be subject to their own husbands as to the Lord. That's what Paul's saying. It's the outworking of being under the control of the Holy Spirit. God's controlling you. You'll start to do his will, won't you? And his will is that you submit, you, you, you submit to your husbands as to the Lord. That's what God originally desired for women in the garden. And that's what he still desires for his daughters today. It doesn't say you are to obey your husbands. That's reserved for children and servants later on in the passage. The husband and wife relationship is different. It's not a commanding and obeying relationship. It's more intimate, it's more mutual. And that's why it says wives are to submit to their own husbands. There's intimacy there, there's love there, there's submission. this submission doesn't imply inferiority, for, as we know, for in Christ there is neither male nor female, Galatians 3.28. The Lord Jesus, after all, is subject to God the Father, comes under his authority, but in no way inferior is he. Neither is the woman inferior to the man. But for the sake of unity, for the sake of harmony, for the sake of peace, and because of God's created design, she is commanded to be subject and submissive to her own husband as she would be to the Lord himself. It isn't the kind of submission that says, I don't like it, but I'm submitting. It's, it's, it's not that. You don't say that to the Lord, or we should not say that, or think that, or begrudgingly submitting. That's not a heart of submission at all. You submit to your husband the way you, should, you would submit to the Lord. And how would you do that? I gladly submit. I happily submit because I love him. I know it honours him and respects him. I know it's his will. You see, you have a higher point of reference here, people. You're submitting to your husband with the same kind of attitude that you would submit to the Lord. It doesn't say that your husband is... is it doesn't say that your husband is the equal of the, of the Lord or he's perfect like Jesus, does it? We know he's not. So many, I've heard women say, oh, no, I'm not going to submit to my husband. He's not Jesus. He's not, you know, he's not perfect. He's, that has nothing to do with it. But we are... But you are to submit in the same way as you would in the Lord Jesus. Why? Ephesians, verse 23. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and himself its saviour. That's the way God designed it. God designed Christ to be the head of the church. God designed the husband to be the head of the wife. That's the way he designed it. That's the way it was that, that, it, that, that, that it has to be. A home without a head is an invitation to chaos. And that's what you have in the curse. Conflict, chaos. The woman trying to rebel and, and master the husband, the husband trying to crush the rebellion. And it's as chaotic as a chaotic as a body without a head. Submission coming under your husband's authority is God's will, but it will not come naturally to you ladies. You got it? It will not come naturally. Genesis 3.16 is natural. Not Ephesians 5.22. For a Christian woman to obey the command to joyfully and lovingly submit to their own husband, she needs to do it in the strength of the Holy Spirit. She needs to do it in the joy of worship with a heart of thanksgiving. 
Jesus is not only the head of the church, verse 23, Ephesians 5, but he's also the saviour of the body. What's the point? What does Paul say? He's also the saviour of the body. When you think of Christ as the head of the church, you don't think of him as a dictator or as a tyrant. Well, I hope you don't. You think of him as a saviour, don't you? A loving saviour. You don't think of him as a, some dominating taskmaster making your life brutally hard and miserable. You think of him as a loving, gracious saviour, a protector. That's a, that's a rescuer, that's a preserver, that's a provider, that's somebody who has your well-being in his heart, that's somebody who is interested in your welfare, somebody interested in the very best for you, that's somebody who rescues you from sin and rescues you from death and rescues you from hell. So the believing husband becomes a saviour of his wife. He becomes the protector, the preserver, the guardian. He makes sure that she is exposed only to things that look after her well-being, physically, morally and spiritually. And then in verse 24 he sums it up. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. No exceptions in everything, Paul says, unless of course submitting to, to your husband violates God's command. If your husband asks you to do something God forbids or asks you to do something that God commands, asks you not to do something God commands, then you must obey God and not him. Now in that humble, loving environment, the rebellion in the curse is quelled. Okay? It's put down because a woman now filled with the spirit, under the control of the spirit, with a happy heart, a, worship, a worshipping heart, uh, worshipping God, filled with gratitude for her salvation and the goodness of God, with a, um, sorry, living in reverence to Christ, submits to her husband the same way she submits to the Lord with a willing and eager heart. And on the other hand, look at the husband who comes under the control of the Holy Spirit in verse 25. I'm not going to focus just on the women here. The curse affects both the husband and the wife, the wife and the husband. Look at verse 25. Husband, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. So instead of him trying to crush this woman, trying to dominate this woman, trying to bring her under control, it says, husband, love your wives. It doesn't say control your wives. It doesn't, it, no, it doesn't say that. He says love her. It doesn't say rule her. It doesn't say order her around. Make sure she does everything you tell her. It doesn't say command her, exercise authority over her or dominate her. It doesn't say any of that. There's nothing here related to authority at all. It just says love her with the deepest kind of love. The love of the will, the love of self-sacrifice, the, the same love of Jesus. A husband has the authority, but, it's, but it is controlled and it is exercised, listen, through love. What a man needs to convince his wife of is that he loves her so much that he's always concerned for her well-being. That makes his authority soft and warm and, then, and inviting, and then his authority is her protection, not a threat to her independence. The husband's love is meant to reflect Christ's love. That is so convicting for every Christian husband, or should be. That's the standard. Love your wife the way Christ love, loves the church. How did Christ love the church? First of all, sacrificially, didn't he? He gave himself up for her. He humbled himself to death, gave up his life. The spirit-filled husband will give his life up for his wife as Christ did for the church. He takes the role of protector, guardian, overseer. There's no tyranny here. There's, no, there's only sacrifice, putting himself second to her, sacrificing his selfish desires for her. Secondly, it's not only sacrificial love, it's a purifying love. Look at verses 26 to 27. That he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor. This is, this is Jesus' love for the church, but the, that the husband's meant to reflect. That he might present the church to himself in splendor without a spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without, blame, without blemish. 
Now, we husbands are to love our wives in a way of sacrifice and in a way of purification. This is really a very beautiful concept. And so many husbands say, oh, I'm not meant to be the pastor. I'm not meant to be the, I'm not, you know, be the spiritual overlooker of my wife. I say, yes, you are. You know, I'll let the Holy Spirit do that. I'll let God do that. No, no, God will do that through you. Not only you, but that's one part of your role to lead in the way of purification. There, there, was, an, there, was, a, there was in ancient Greece a custom, a bride was bathed in sacred water prior to, the, to her wedding. And it was a custom symbolising her purification from, from, for her husband, symbolising a cleansing from any previous defilement and entrance into a pure life. Well, marriage was, was to be a purifying environment for the woman and a man as well. A husband should never want to do anything that exposes their wife to anything that is impure, any, te- any, te- any temptation, any pure, impure influence, should be, should, you should protect your wife from, from that. Any um, True love, listen to this, this, is, this applies to anything actually, your kids, anything. True love is always concerned with purity. You got it? If you love your kids, you, 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 you want them to be holy. So here is a man who loves his wife with a, with a Jesus sort of love. You know, and, 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 and in a world's point of view of love, a lot of, a lot of men get their wives to do in, 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 in the sexual act things that are impure, and that's not love, that's just lust. Any love which weakens the moral fibre of someone is a false love. Love seeks to sacrifice itself for, for the other and to pursue the purity of its object just in the way Christ sought the purity of his church. You think Christ is concerned about the purity of his church? Absolutely. He wants to present to himself a church, verse 27, that doesn't have a spot or wrinkle or any such or any blemish but pure and holy it is, so it's not only a husband's love, like Jesus' love, is a sacrificial love, it's a purifying love, and verse 28, verses 28 to 30, it's a cherishing love. Look at 28 to 30. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. Who, he who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and what? Cherishes it just as Christ does the church because we are members of his body. What he means is, 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 is you love your wife with the same way you love yourself. You don't have to learn to love yourself. Did you know that? You do it naturally. You take care of you. That's what you do. You look after, number one, you. You feed you. You dress you. You make, you, you make sure that all your needs are met. Well, that's exactly the way you want to take care of your wife, the same kind of attentiveness same kind of devotion, same kind of consistency that you give to yourself. She is not just a cook and clothes washer and a babysitter. You want to cherish her. I'm preaching to myself here. You want to cherish her, he says, uh, and, and, and I, I know Helen loves that term. I love that term. We cherish our own flesh. We nourish our own flesh. Cherish in the Greek means to warm with body heat, to soften, to melt. It's used of mother birds sitting in the nest with their little birds all around them. And furthermore, it's not only sacrificial love and a purifying love and a cherishing love, but this love that a husband has is a covenantal love. Look at verse 31. We know we finished, guys. Therefore a man shall leave... This is all to say... Paul's saying is that... Under the control of the Holy Spirit, marriage can be transformed and redeemed from the curse. Not, not perfectly, absolutely. Every marriage, Christian marriage is imperfect. Because we don't, we're not fully under the control of the Holy Spirit, are we? Look at, look at verse 31. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Where is that a quote from? Genesis, that's right, Genesis 2.24, and it indicates the permanent character of a marriage. 
It is indissoluble. It is unbreakable. It is securing for a woman to know that a husband is not looking for someone else or someone better. He has a covenant love for her. You got it? This is so different to the world today. Love needs to be secure. The way God is set up, it is secure. But t today, what, you know what I'm saying? It's so insecure. And love flourishes in security. Lindley knows, you know what I'm saying? I'm with her. That's it. To the day I die. There's no divorce, such thing divorce in our, in our, in our agreement. Nothing. No agreement. No, that's, that's the blessing of having two Christians who agree to that. That's secure, isn't it? You need that security for love to flourish. That's why so many people today just like, oh, I don't know if I want to get married, you know. We, we, we move in together, we, we act like we're married, and all that, but oh, I don't know if I want to get married. Well, what you're saying, that's very selfish because you know what? You're not really loving your wife or your future wife or whatever because love needs security for it to flourish. You love your wife with a sacrificial... Christian husbands are to love their wife with a sacrificial, purifying, cherishing, and a covenantal love as Jesus loves. You do that because that's how Christ loves his church. Now, like women submitting to men, this sort of love, men, does not come naturally. Even Christian men, we must be spirit-filled, spirit-led, under the control of God's word. Um, and so if this happens, in spite of the curse, marriage can be, can be the best relationship on earth. The New Testament calls it the grace of life. That's the way of saying it's the best. Human relationship. Now we understand, let me just, uh, now we understand sin, sin hit marriage really hard. It hit marriage hard just because everybody in the family is a sinner. The, the husband's a sinner, the wife is a sinner. Then we bring children in and, and that even compounds it more because as their fallenness is mingled with their own fallenness, in that environment the woman, because of a special curse, wants to propel herself to the fulfilment of all her own desires. She, wants to, she doesn't want to submit. It's not something she wants to do. Submission is a dirty word. It's actually a repulsed word by her, deep down, unless she's been redeemed. She wants control. She wants her own way. She wants her will. And, and the man is given then to, have, to having to try to overpower her, dominate her, and there's the conflict. And the only hope is the power of Jesus and his gospel. The only hope is the work of the Holy Spirit in the hearts of his people. And so let's not be idealistic about Mother's Day, people. Really, Mother's Day is also a celebration of, not a celebration, a mourning of brokenness. How many times we go to a store, you know, a lot of people go look for cards and they read through, if they're really honest, it's really hard to find a card unless they want to lie about how they feel. And so many people lie, don't they? About how they feel. And do this sort of, everything's great, I love you, mother, you're the best in the world. Really? You know what I'm saying? We just want to paint this picture like, let's just be reality people. Yeah, we've got to celebrate and thank God for our mums. And if you have a godly mum, that's even a, such a blessing. But you know what I'm saying? But, but there's so much brokenness in not just Mother's Day, Father's Day, Children's Day. Malika said this week, we don't even have Children's Day. I said, every day is Children's Day, buddy. You know, you have birthdays, Christmas, you know, all sorts of things, you know. Anyway, isn't it funny? But you know, it's just like, We have a new perspective on Mother's Day. We can, we can celebrate our mothers without glossing over the brokenness and the curse. And just stop, we've got to stop pretending, really. Well, let me just close by saying the curse is there and it doesn't get mitigated except through Jesus. And like so many realities in our world, you can talk to sociologists, you can talk to psychologists, you can talk to professors, you can talk to experts, and they have not got a clue of why things the way they are. But you do, fellow Christians. You do. You have the wisdom from above through God's word.
In our study of Genesis, we have, you know, we have, we are, we're adding to our worldview, and some of us, we already have that worldview, a right understanding, a right worldview. Um, and I'm just going to finish it there. So let's pray. Father God, we just thank you so much that through Jesus there is hope. There's hope for us sinful people, Lord. Sinful mothers, sinful wives, sinful husbands, sinful dads, sinful children. There's hope through the gospel, through the Lord Jesus. Lord, please bless our marriages, bless our relationships with our kids. Help us to be spirit-filled and spirit-led people so that we may see and taste heaven on earth in Jesus' name. Amen.